in, in terms of product, I think now it's more diversified than before. I agree with, with Chloe at the beginning, it, it was more focused on the distribution channel part, brokerage, and, and now it's, it's more, more broader on the value chain. On, on the insurtech, uh, one thing may be interesting, it's, it's the new open banking model. So how this model impact as uh, insurtech for the future? I think it could be it could be something really interesting. And after a SaaS model, software as a service model, now we have more uh, bank as a service and, and insurance as a service model. So we will see in the future how how this could impact the the value chain of of the classical career model. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with uh, with what Chloe said uh, before. I think the first obvious trend was the move from the B2C to B2B. I think the reason for that is that most uh, insurtech underestimated the cost of acquisition for customer, the power of the brand, and the power of the network of the insurance carriers. Um, in that field, compared to fintech, because we are also very involved in fintech, uh, the user experience is, doesn't change that much the game for uh, f in the insurance field that is doing in the, in the financial space, just because people have less interaction with their insurance product than with their banking products. Um, I think WeFox in Germany was the first player to make this, this change and to move from B2C to B2B. Um, and, and regarding the, the second trend, which is going deeper and deeper into the stack, so from the distribution layer to now, um, I don't know, like fraud detection, like uh, actuaries, uh, what we call augmented uh, sales, uh, all those new new products, uh, that's really the, the, the new trend. And I think the reason for that is that the insurance carriers now are, are more open than before to reconsider and to rethink uh, those tools which are definitely changing their core business. We are talking about their pricing model, uh, all those things. And now they are, they are more aware of the, the need to change. And the reinsurers, of course, are particularly open. Um, so I guess... Um, with, uh, with, with this uh, thematic trend, uh, you look at some of the very large raises of um, you know, WeFox and uh, Next recently, I guess. Um, in these segments, is it the, uh, the insurtechs with the most funding win because they have the, the time and the, the runway to, to, to reach the customers? Or um, is there still a chance in some of these segments um, on B2B to see uh, for companies to acquire funding now and catch up? I think it really depends on the project and the ambition. Well, when you want to disrupt the whole global insurance market, like Refox, you're, you're going to need some money. <laughs> and also because they, um, they are an insurance carrier. But sometimes when you have a very specific model, uh, broker model, you definitely don't need that money and you can uh, grow. Uh, organically, but also uh, by acquiring companies thanks to debt and uh, just uh, by organic growth. So, so it really depends on your model and what you need. And I suppose with um, very large rounds, the, the problem of valuation really starts to um, rear its head. And, you know, it, we're in interesting times at the moment. We have uh, a potentially challenging macroeconomic environment. Uh, we have... Um, you know, what uh, some VCs would call a normalization of values in other sectors, um, you know, some, some headline issues. And I am interested to know whether you think that in, um, in SureTech there is um, a case to be made that some of the valuations right now, because of the amount of funding that some people have raised, uh, are uh, what I would say in English is frothy, but apparently that's not a good w use of the word in French. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the valuations are rising maybe ahead of where uh, the sector is. I think yeah, we see we see a lot of money on the insure tech market today because uh, a lot of a lot of uh, um, VC fund more generalist fund now um, want to focus on the on the insure tech and see values they can add uh, on this uh, on this industry. I think it's 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 quite hard to to know if this is the right valuation or not, because this is an equation be between the amount you want to raise as a startup to your to your ne next step and um, the, 
uh, the deletion, the captable you have. So it, it, it's quite a complex equation, I think, to see if this is the right valuation or not. But what I want to, to, to say is, I think you have to, to raise the right amount of money for, for your maturity and want to raise more. Um, of course, you have inflation on, on, on your valuation, but maybe the next step would be more difficult uh, to, to, to achieve. So. Um, it's always a, a good question about the valuation, but I think for distribution model, it's quite easy to assess. For more specific model, it's sometimes quite hard and, and need to be more expert on this field to, to see if this is the right size or not. So, but yeah, I, we will see at the end. <laughs> I, I don't fully agree with you. For, for me, it's not that easy to assess the distribution model. Um, because there are many, many insurtech that are growing uh, a lot, uh, but then you have to assess the, the quality of the portfolio, the loss ratio, the margin. Uh, for me, it's easier to assess, for example, the SaaS business, and you're right, the, just the multiple in SaaS business, which is a really standardized market, have nearly doubled over the last four years or five years, from five to six times uh, the, the revenue to now sometimes 12, even 15, uh, which is very, too high, I think, and, and very crazy. Um, it's hard to say uh, you're right, and if it's the right valuation or not, and we'll see when the company will, uh, will go public, and the latest uh, development show that it's, that the VC are not always right. Um, and um, I, for me, the main reason for this high valuation is that there is more or less the same amount of insure tech on the market than before, but there is just simply far more money than, than before. Uh, now the corporate venture are here, the insurance carriers are investing a lot. Even the asset manager are looking for returns that they can't find on the obligation or debt market. And that now uh, looking more and more at private equity, including venture capital. So um, don't, don't shoot me here, but uh, is, is it a case that there's just more money? Or is it a case that um, potentially some of the strategic money is less disciplined? And I, I obviously know what I would say, but uh, what do you think? Of course, there is more strategic money on this uh, on this field. I think the, uh, we will see a lot of corporate venture um, insurance company uh, have their own corporate venture. All the reinsurers also have their own corporate venture program. Also, I think so. Of course, there is there is more money, and and we, we see now more focus funds. So we are two on the ground here. So there is more and more focus focus fund and uh, sector focus fund on, on on this field. So I think yes, but um, there is less investment before. So maybe we see the rise of valuation, uh, like like on the e-commerce e-commerce trend. Um, Ten, seven years ago. So, is it is it normal or not? It, it's quite for me. It's quite difficult to assess. And I suppose we're we're coming to a moment now where um, there's really a, a, a huge number of insure techs who started maybe two, three years ago, and they're coming to a point where um, previous funding is running out. And there's there's a natural attrition and some uh, quite public uh, examples of companies where unfortunately things have not worked out. And uh, I suppose my question, um, Chloe, is maybe. Does this have an impact on uh, how people are reassessing uh, the sector in terms of valuation, or do they see, you know, the prudential acquisition of assurance in the U.S. and think, well, actually, um, <laughs> if I can get 30 times uh, next year's earnings, then uh, maybe uh, I'm not put off? Um, I don't have so many uh, um, negative cases in mind. Mm -hmm. Which com well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not falling for the trap. Um. Um. Uh, well, I think what's very important for um, insurtech company is to make sure that you, well, that you, is yeah, that you manage to raise funds according to to your model. So some companies will uh, need a lot of time be before being um, profitable. Uh, some ca some company can reach profit profitability very quickly, and you just have to make sure so at each round that you're raising enough money to um, to achieve a next step. So either reaching profitability or just showing better economic performance. So I think sometimes, for instance. Um, 
insurance brokers with B2C models sometimes. So I think they uh, didn't really succeed in proving the economics where um, would work. Um, and at some point, so you're trying to raise a new, a new round of funding and just your economics do not work. You, you, you have not proved that your model um, is the right one. So, so that's an issue. But if you have a bigger goal, so some, just if you want to be an insurance carrier or if you want to do, well, just something else, at each round of funding, you just have to show the improvements of your economics, and you should be able to uh, have a short-term target, so should it be one year or three years, saying, so at this point, I will be there, the, well, the mod this model will work, because you, you cannot really live uh, so far from the reality during 10 years, so at some point, you will, you will face reality, either with an IPO or an acquisition, and uh, if each time you're acquiring a customer, you're just losing money, well, in 10 years, it will be uh, the same problem. So, so that's why some, some companies just stop and try to switch their model. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, we, we were having dinner with one of our portfolio companies um, last night. And we, we were talking through quite an interesting challenge in the B2B uh, space where because the, the lag is very long in terms of the, the contracts being established and the sales process and revenue coming through. Um, <laughs> I see you raising your eyebrows, Helen. Um, you know, one of those challenges is once the pipeline gets to a certain point, you have this problem where you don't necessarily have all the people you need to maximize the opportunity. Um, but for founders, there's this question of, okay, is now the right time to take dilution or do I wait so there's more revenue and I get a better valuation? And so in, interested to know, um, Maxim, how you think about that balance. Yeah, you're uh, absolutely right. Um, and especially with the insure tech uh, addressing insurance carriers or so working in the B2B space, uh, you're right, that's very large contract that can uh, uh, that can be closed at any time. Sometimes you just look at the at, at the booking trend and you say, oh, okay, that's a very bad year. And you just wait two months, you close two large deal and that's a wonderful year. Uh, so I think at, at to assess those companies, it really makes sense to have a really close look at the pipeline. And I think that uh, sector-focused investors like, like, like you, for example, Hélène, or, or, may, or maybe Blackfin, we, we have this, uh, this knowledge to, to, to very understand the sales cycle of the insurance carriers, how they think, how they make the decision, uh, and to be able to have a, a clear understanding of the pipeline, because that's where there is most of the value, given, as you say, the long sales cycle. And uh, I think we, we've just seen a, a real trend of some of the, um, the, the US VCs coming to Europe. Uh, there was a big roadshow recently from uh, Sequoia and a, a few others, um, kind of hitting uh, 20 companies a day in each center. Um, and, you know, I think when I talk to them, a lot of the feedback we get is um, Europe uh, is maybe considered cheap from a valuation point of view compared to the Valley in New York. Uh, would you agree? Or <laughs> Uh, and would you uh, do, do you see this kind of uh, move of capital from the US into Europe as a positive thing? The thing is that when you're a European company, especially in the insurance sector, you want scale uh, in the large market just like they do in the US. So I think in Europe it's much more challenging to, to expand in new countries uh, because regulatory is different and, well, markets also very different. So I think that's also an explanation behind the difference in terms of valuation. I think there is uh, the, the key point is also the exit. There is less exit in Europe today than, than in the US. So uh, it's easier today to yeah to exit a company, and I think this is key point for 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 valuation. Um, yeah, in terms of money, there is much, much more money also to deploy in the, in the US and in, than in Europe. I, I totally understand why they want to, to play this European trend today, but um, it's, it's not the same market than, than in the US. So, and I think at, at score you are, uh, you know really well the, the both market, European and US market, and it's, it's, it's totally different. So we will see. 
Well, to answer your question, I think it depends. Either they come uh, to finance a company you're already in, or you're competing with them on the same company. So I wouldn't have the same answer depending on the situation. Uh, in the first one, I would be very happy. <laughs> I would say I, th I think uh, having this kind of investor at the cap table, it really brings the spotlight on the company, and it really helps in terms of exit because those guys are used to to sell many companies to the largest corporate or even to the GAFA, um, and they have close close connection with those guys every day. So of course, it's far easier to to to, to exit a company when you have this kind of uh, investor in the cap table. Um, but yeah, when you're competing with them, it's hard because they have different. Um, um, different valuation range in mind, they have different strategy, they are far more aggressive, they have more money also to play this kind of game. Sometimes they don't know the, the European market uh, and maybe they make some mistake uh, which are good for the corporates, uh, for, for the startups, sorry. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, I would say it's a good thing. It means that the, the, the European ecosystem is getting more and more mature and more and more uh, attractive. I, I think that this is a really good investor, and, and when you play a global investment model, I think you have metrics, and you can also compare metrics between all geographies. So um, that's that's why what we are doing at Portage, but uh, for sure Sequoia is doing the same thing. So so I think it it's quite interesting to to see them. Yes, uh, more and more in, investing in Europe. I mean, I, I think it's a real challenge to normalize um, some of the metrics, particularly on things like uh, adware-driven CAC and insurance, because the U.S. market is so specific uh, there. Well, so expensive, I mean. Um, I, I suppose playing devil's advocate, the, um, the challenge you get sometimes when you hear this story of the confidence it brings to the sector is the accusation, um, probably we've all heard, that um, a lot of VCs are uh, sheep. <laughs> so the brand name comes in and then the company goes, but unless there is that commitment and that leadership, um, it, it, it cannot take place. And one of the things I'm interested in in, in, uh, in SureTech is how much is the, the vote of confidence from uh, a knowledgeable strategic investor at a, an A round or a B round considered to be um, a, a good thing um, since they have this understanding of the sector or, or how much is it a case where, um, you know, in, in terms of the benefit for founders and the investors in a round, a different skill set is looked for. Basically, I'm asking you to be nice about strategics. Uh, as a sector focus fund, I think there is no difference in terms of expertise mm. internally at Portage and in, in an insurance company or, or um, a, a, a bank. So I, I, I think uh, it's for us, yes, we, we, we can compete in terms of expertise with, with, I think, classical insurer, and I was part of an insurance company before, so. <laughs> yeah, well, when we close around, we always try to, to find the right mix. Mm. So if we have one or two generalist VC, we'll always try to find uh, either just an independent board member, which is an expert in the specific sector, or then a sector-focused VC. Uh, that can co-invest, so it's always a matter of mix. Mm. It can come from very, yeah, in very different maniers, so either just an independent board member, or a business angel, or, um, or a VC. Mm. And um, this is maybe a unique panel because uh, I'm not sure I've ever been on one with uh, four <laughs> French uh, companies at the same time. Uh, so wh what's unique about the French uh, ecosystem as we sit here in uh, Station F? I don't think it's unique. I think we are, we're catching up. It's, uh, the ecosystem is definitely uh, much less mature than, for instance, in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, well, in the fintech and insurtech space, the opportunity is is uh, promising, I think, for, for founders because they have big banks and big insurance companies and reinsurance companies in France. Mm -hmm. So I think that helps. The whole ecosystem is, is here. Um, but I would say it's starting. Only. Um, I'm a bit biased and I will compare it with the German market that I know quite well that I'm covering uh, regularly. Uh, in France, I see far less uh, regulated players. I think there is just one uh, in your in Alan, by the way, uh, which is not the case in Germany when you are close to ten uh, now regulated players with license, mostly PNC, but they are full stack player. Um, in uh, France, we see less dis pure distribution play. I would say, 
Um, I think there are two reasons for that. Maybe French people are less, are not the earliest uh, adopters, or maybe less tech friendly compared to Anglo-Saxon uh, countries, I would say. Um, and also in France, there are uh, strong insurance carriers with big brands, large uh, distribution network that of course, uh, it ha so of course, it's harder to compete in terms of distribution with uh, with those players. In Germany, for example, it's not the case. Uh, apart from Allianz, there are many different uh, and sm and smaller uh, insurance carriers. And and maybe last point uh, regarding the second wave of innovation that we mentioned at the beginning, which is more uh, going into the stack and and disrupting the or improving the workflow of the insurance carriers. We see more and more interesting stuff in France. Uh, we have today here uh, Accurate, for example, which is a very innovative company and interesting play. And I think that's also due to the to the quality of the of the of the engineers and the data scientists that we have in France. And we are very lucky to have the, those kind of people. And I think in this second wave of distribution, which is less focused on the distribution uh, layer but more on the tech stack, we have a very good um, card to play in France. And on the the VC side, um, you know. There's a lot of talk about uh, the amount of dry powder still left uh, for VCs to deploy, uh, and also potentially, again, touching on the themes we've already discussed of the, the WeWork issues and the, um, the macroeconomic conditions, maybe a tightening of supply to VCs themselves. And one of the things I think uh, these conferences never really hear about is the, the challenges of raising uh, funds uh, and going through that cycle. Um, so I'd be interested if uh, any of you have Kind of any thoughts on how difficult it is right now to raise funds as a VC? Well, I think that the trend is still very positive. As um, well, many investors are turning to private equity and venture also. And we see also in France many um, corporates, so many, well, just large uh, traditional groups. Uh, just willing to better connect with startups and so investing in a VC fund could help um, just better know their online competitors, mm -hmm. um, better connect with, uh, yeah, with other startups. So that's also a strong trend that push many corporates to, to invest in VC funds. Um, just to, to be able not to get disrupted but innovate together. So, so I don't think that uh, um, yeah, some failed APOs and other cases had an impact yet. I think it depends if you have already a well-established LP based or not. So um, for, Port for Portage, our, our uh, main LPs are, are based in Canada. Uh, so we have um, big LP based there, less in, in Europe and uh, in, in Asia for the moment, but yes, few few European investors. And of course, yeah, it's, it's, more, it's more difficult when you have this, this LP base already established. But I think um, when you are sector-focused fund, uh, investors are coming not only for um, returns, um, but also for, for strategic views and discussion you could have with them in terms of partnerships and, and create more links between uh, your portfolio companies and, and, and their innovation team. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the reasons uh, and w one of the main criteria to, to, to look f uh, during the fundraising uh, from an LP perspective is the number of funds. And now there are far more VC funds than, than before. And as you say, Ellen, having this kind of, of, diff, of uh, specific positioning, like being sector focused, for example, really makes sense and really makes a difference to differentiate yourself from other VC that could be potential um, um, investment for the LPs. Uh, so I would say that as uh, having this sector focused. Um, uh, the sector focus positioning, sorry, which is not that common on the market uh, today, uh, we, we feel quite confident regarding the next uh, the next fundraising. So we we have maybe um, one minute left. So uh, maybe very quickly, uh, what, what's the one thing um, when the founder is deciding who to work with as a VC, the one thing they should really concentrate on? Well, the founder. When yeah, why, why should they pick you? Ah. 
Well, just to make sure they really understood uh, the, st the strategy of the VC, so and uh, and also to make sure that they they know uh, how much money they will have to raise in the future. So when you're raising your Series A and you're planning to raise 500 million euro more in the next five years, you won't pick the same VC than if you're raising your Series A and then you think you're gonna reach profit profitability afterwards and that's it. So you have to know if you're picking a long-term investor or if you're just a uh, long-term investor, meaning that the, the investors will be able to to be deep pocket and be able to reinvest in the long term, or if you're just looking for the partner for this specific phase. This is a real question. Um, what are you looking for? What kind of shareholders do you want? And, and this is a question of trust. Uh, do we want to work together? I think this is, at the, at the end, this is a key question. So, and sector focus is, is not the, the, I think this is not the same. We have an operating platform. So how we can help you bring more value in, in, in your growth step. So, but yeah, it's, it's always a question of what the ideal shareholders for you and can, can we um, can we play this role with you? So you mean what are we looking for uh, at the startups, or what the startups are looking for uh, at the investors? The second. Okay, so they, yeah, they should definitely look for value-added partners. Uh, as we said before, finding money on the market it's not that difficult at the moment. At the moment, so lucky you. Um, the real the real point is um, it's good to have um, the bigger check now, the best valuation now, but it's a short-term strategy because it's better sometimes to have a slightly lower valuation uh, and a partner that can bring you further, that can uh, make you go faster. And of course, having uh, sector-focused investors that know the market uh, makes a difference, especially now that we are going deeper and deeper in, into the stack in terms of disruption that you need to know exactly how the insurance carriers are working, what they need, what are the pain points, how they make the decision. Um, and of course, having those, those people on board that can help you, uh, think totally makes uh, sense. Well, thank you very much, uh, all three of you, and please join me in giving uh, everyone a big round of applause.